All right, back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands. Husbands. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that it may, he may present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives, even in his own body. He that loveth his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. And for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall be one flesh. All right, husbands. By the way, just out of here, how many of you have dogs? Are those big things up here? Yeah. Oh, a lot of you have dogs. Just, you know, there's a very simple test. A lot of people wonder, they actually, you know, their dogs can be so loving, and, and some men are kind of insecure. They don't know, does my wife love me the most, or does my dog? And uh, it's a struggle for a lot of people, but it's, a, it's really a pretty easy thing to solve, to figure it out. When you leave tomorrow morning, just put your wife and the dog and lock them in the garage. And when you come home at night, see who's the happiest to see you. And, uh, and, and then, you, then you figured it out. So not a hard thing. So the husband, though. The role of the husband, you know, as, uh, as we know, you know, I mean, one of the things here, again, we're, we're looking at two people filled with the Spirit. They have a joy that's, that's in the Lord. They're so thankful for him. He's with them through all the trials, all the struggles, all the issues. Determined to help them get through it. Be there to work within their hearts. Giving them a submissive heart, one to another. And uh, then as he brings us together, he has these roles, as we've already said. It's not about the greater or lesser or the smarter or the more spiritual. It's just simply a call, a role, function. One of the things it takes, you pick any sport that has more than one person doing it, and you have roles. You know, you play doubles in tennis. You, what's, who's up, who's back, who's right, left, or all this other thing. You play a, you know, basketball. I grew up, grew up playing sports. Everybody has a role. And it wasn't a greater or lesser. It's just, you know, where, where do you fit best? And where's your role? You know, and, uh, it's, uh, and it takes all of them to do it or they wouldn't have that team. And uh, what makes the team is they've got here the five roles in basketball. Here's the 11 roles in, in football and uh, whatever it is. You, that's your role. It's not a greater or lesser. It's, it's, it's making the whole thing succeed. And when people look at a marriage, here's the role. Two people, in terms of their joy, their love, their happiness, uh, working it through, they found that in him. And, uh, and once again, here now as we look at the husband and his love for his wife and his role. Once again, 1 Corinthians 11.3, but I would have you to know uh, that the head of every man is Christ and the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God. It's a role. And, uh, and here he looks at a man and he says, you are the head. Now the big question is, what does that mean? And that's something that I think a lot of people have a very difficult time figuring out. We interpret. I grew up in a, in a family where kind of like men were men and women were women, whatever that may be. Uh, my parents came to the Lord when I was around junior high school, and that kind of started changing some things. But uh, it was something to where, you know, the men supposed to be men and macho and tough or whatever else sort of a thing. And uh, my dad played some sports and... and uh, you know, through school, and we did two and things, but you just have these images. And I just knew to me, okay, I'm, I'm the head. Didn't know what it meant, particularly, and uh, you get married and you have a concept of what it is. And uh, it's funny, Gene and I, uh, all the way through our dating process, we really, we loved the Lord, we loved each other, and we'd go out and we'd talk and we'd share and we'd pray together. We never really argued. We always got along uh, quite well, and we would see some of our friends who would get to fight. And they'd argue, they'd say, well, why do you get married? Why do this if you're going to not get along? And there's this kind of tension, and you aren't even married yet, and you have these difficulty times. It's just like, that's crazy. 
But once you get married, things, there is something that happens. The Bible calls it a yoke, <laughs> you know? I mean, you now, you take, you know, one of the things that the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked, and that, you know, one of the things they would never do, they all knew that when he said that. I mean, you would, you know, a horse or a donkey or an ox, they could all pull a plow. They could all do that. And, uh, and, and you could have two ox, they could pull it together, or two donkeys, but you would never take, you know, a mule and an ox and put a yoke on them. They'll kill each other. One of them has a motion step, it's forward, back, and the other one that's kind of up and down. And now you put them together and you put a yoke on them, they'll tear each other apart just in the process because they don't, they don't walk together. They don't have the same movements in, uh, you know, with it. And when you get married, a yoke, you, it's, you, you get yoked. And now all of a sudden things that were no big deal when you were just kind of walking along, now you're sensitive to them. And, uh, and now you, now you what, what are we going to do about this? And here we get married. And on our honeymoon, we get married down in Pasadena in Southern California. And we're going up the coast, Highway 1. If you've ever been on that uh, Pacific Coast Highway, it's just a beautiful ride all along the Pacific. And we're going up on our honeymoon, driving up there. And we get into a discussion. I don't know what it was going on, but we started we're not agreeing. And uh, again, I don't remember what it was all about. I, I just remember I was right. <laughs> I'm not sure what it was about, but that, that I was quite sure of. And I kind of said something, and then she said something that was, was wrong. Well, I loved her. I'm patient. So I just very gracefully, I, I corrected it, you know, and then <laughs> go on. Well, and uh, she, she then goes a little farther, and then she actually restated the same error Again, I thought, well, I'm sure she heard me, you know, or something on this. I mean, uh, uh, you know, and, and so then I say it again. I realize, that, you know, this is not right. I got to deal with this. And, of course, back then, they'd, I wish they had, you know, these car cams and stuff, you know, on, you know, where you can actually record things. Because I wish this was recorded. I handled it that good. I really, it was, <laughs> it was. It was incredible. I wish you could have seen it, but we don't have it. But because I'm up there, I thought, well, let's just handle this. Let's take care of this. You know, there's no big deal. It's very beautiful. I pull over to the side of the road, looking over the Pacific. And, I, and again, I wish it was recorded because I, I'm still quite impressed with it. And, but I turned to her and I said, uh, look, I said, I, I feel I, I didn't raise my voice. Neither one of us ever been yellers or screamers or door slammers anyway. But I just said, I, I, I need... I need to make something clear, I guess. And uh, from now on, if I say something, that's how it is. <laughs> Period. And I mean, it was that sweet. It was really, really good. You know, so I still wish it was recorded. Gene, on the other hand, totally unprepared for this, which kind of shocked me. I thought she would be, but anyway, she, all of a sudden, she starts crying. And not only she, her head fell off of her shoulders, fell off. She, she caught it in her hands down there. And she says, oh, Jesus, what have I done? You know, there, you know, and, and she's, just, she's just shattered by this. I am sitting there thinking about, wow, we really needed this conversation. You know, I mean, type, I mean it was like, because I knew, I don't, I, I don't want to, I don't want to fight. I don't want to, I, 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 I don't, you don't want to henpeck me for the next 50 years. I don't want to be henpecked. And so let's just solve it now. And that's how it is. I thought it was a very necessary conversation. And, uh, and as we have this though, I mean, that's somehow or another, we, we kind of got on driving and, and kind of moved on a little bit, you know, with the thing. But I was kind of like, the story maybe you've heard of a honeymoon, you know, 150 years ago, this couple, and they're going down the road on their honeymoon in an ox cart, and they're, you know, the donkey's pulling them down the road, and uh, they go so far, and uh, uh, there as they go down, the, the, the donkey, the mule just sits down all on its own. The guy takes out a buggy whip and starts smacking the mule, and he says, get up, get up. I didn't tell you to stop. Get moving. Well, he gets up, goes on down the road, goes a little farther, sits down again. This time he sits down again. He pulls out, and he just thrashes this donkey, 
just gives it a royal thrashing. I didn't tell you, get going, get moving. Well, it gets moving again. A little while later, it sits down a third time. This time, he pulls out a shotgun, and he blows it away. And as soon as he does this, this his brand new wife, she just gets hysterical. She just starts screaming. She just out. Oh, she just can't believe what just happened. And, but he just very calmly he looks over to her and he says, "That's one." And uh, you know sometimes people just you know they just kind of look, okay, that's once. Don't do that again. And and to me, I think when I actually got married, I think that that was what. That's what the world, I kind of th- thought maybe, maybe it was. But that's not being head. That was the way the world kind of thought. But, I mean, that's being head by fear or by force or by threat or anger or hostility. Uh, as a force subjection. That's a carnal man's nature to do that. And, uh, but, you know, in terms of I, whatever I have to do to be head, I'm going to be head. Whatever we have to do to make it clear who you are and who I am and how this thing's going to work, I've got to do it. And uh, get that settled. And that's, honestly, I was, I love the Lord, but I was, uh, I wanted to serve him and follow him. And, and I, sometimes you got to get married to find out some things that the Lord looks at and says, they're not right. But you don't notice that you get married until you try some of these shenanigans that you kind of thought were what, how life should be or something. And I do this thinking at the time it was kind of right but you when you begin to realize the bible's real clear here it says you know that husbands love your wife as christ loved the church he's the head as he is the head of the body of christ so you got a model there he doesn't just say you determine when you're loving her how it is or what it is to be head no you are head of your wife as christ is the head of the church now he could do it any way he wants he could do it by force (laughs) <laughs> he could take any one of us anytime and just flick us to China if he wanted. <laughs> and every one of us get it. What do you want? You got, you win. That's settled. You know, from then on, anything he says, yeah, I don't want to get flicked to China again, you know, thing. And we've got that fear there, but he, he, he doesn't, that, that isn't love. That isn't what he wants uh, there. He didn't want forced subjection. He could have it any time, but he, he wants to, he, he's head by model. He's headed head there, you know, by we're to love our wife and be head of our wife the same way as Jesus is the head of the church. Matthew 23, 11, Jesus said, but he that is greatest among you, and he said, you, you, know, you shall be your servant. Mark 9, 35, he said unto them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last and the servant of all. Luke 22, 25, and he said to them, the kings and the, Gal- uh, uh, the Gentiles, they exercise authority over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But you shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. And here Jesus, you know, he said, no, you're, he, he's head by saviorhood. He's the head by patience and kindness and gentleness. He's the model of it. He, you know, he, he takes our entire lifetime, essentially, you know, wanting to be head of our lives, head of our homes, head of our marriages, head of our, you know, of, of us. But he's amazingly kind and gentle and patient, you know, with it when he could do, do, accomplish that objective so easily if he wanted to use force, if he wanted to use another mean other than person, than, than, than patience and grace and mercy and these things. He's a model by self-sacrifice. And, uh, and I think, you know, when, one day when, when a man, when we would stand before the Lord and to give an answer, I don't think he's going to ask me so much, you know, uh, what kind of house did you get her, a car or clothes or jewelry uh, and things. You, you know, where did you lead her? Where did you lead her? Yeah, you know, she changed her name, address, phone number, future, purpose, identity to follow you. Where'd you lead her? And how did you do it uh, as her head? How was that carried out? And here, you know, when we look there as, as a husband and, uh, and, and, and have to go through these lessons, to me it was a difficult one to realize, again, my pattern, my concept. I wasn't, you know, kind of some sort of, to me, thinking I'm macho or I'm forceful. I'm just, this is just, I thought this was the right thing to do. The, you know, the, the, where I was at in that stage in my life. I really, I didn't think it was a bad thing. It wasn't like I was trying to be threatening. I was just... This, no, this has to be done. It'll, be, it'll work better if we figure this out. 
But uh, I was wrong, obviously. Well, here, you know, here, then, then when Paul says to love your wife as Christ of the church and uh, gave himself for it, he then explains what love is. How does somebody say, do they love their wife as Christ of the church? Well, I said, well, I love my wife. And I, I want to love her as Christ of the church. He said, okay, then let me ask you a few questions. Because here's what Jesus did as the head of the church. First of all, it says there that he might sanctify. He might sanctify it. And the very, the very first thing that, that a husband is to do when he gets married and he loves his wife and he wants to be that role model, he wants to be head, as he looks at the husband, he says, all right, sanctify your wife. And you know, essentially, that word saint, to sanctify holy, holiness, they all come from the same root word in both Greek and Hebrew. It simply means to essentially set apart for sacred use. It is something there that Jesus has taken the, ch the church, taken his bride, and we are his joy and crown. He has set us apart. Uh, you know, from everything else. He created the you know, universe, he created the world, he created everything. But in the midst of it, you know, the Lord spoke the world into existence. One day he'll speak it out and he'll have something at the end he didn't have at the beginning. His church, his wife, his bride. And, uh, and he set it apart, not only in this life, but eternally. They're set apart for sacred use. We are, we, again, we're his joy and his crown. And, and one of the things that I think that is so difficult for us to learn, at least it was very difficult for me to learn, was what that practically meant to, to sanctify your wife. I, I never really even knew the word very well at the time. I had no idea the concept of it. But I do know that when we got married, uh, it was funny, the year that, that we got married, uh, we were in a lot of weddings. I, uh, I had a lot of my friends and family, people getting married. We got married in December. I was in, I think, about a dozen weddings, I think 11 actually. And, uh, you know, but the, and then, then, then along came mine. But the thing is, is that basically they're all roughly about the same in one sense. When you look at the, most of you probably got married with kind of the English, the old English style wedding where, you know, the bride's family and relatives are on one side and the husband and the grooms are on the other and there's the bridesmaids and there's the groomsmen. And, uh, you know, they get the whole, everybody in and seated according to priority. You know, they're on the front row, there's the moms and dads and then maybe the grandmas and grandpas and then maybe uncles and aunts and other relatives and cousins. And they just kind of work back. And, uh, and then after that, you know, in most weddings, at that point, we just sit down, you know, or whatever. Uh, if you're bringing a gift, you, you're welcome here, you know, or something. But just come on in. Where, but actually, in the old English, I mean, if you've ever even watched some of the royal marriages, like over in England still, literally everybody is set, literally, specifically where they were from the bride. And everybody, they literally measure out, if you've ever read any of this, it's quite interesting. Every seat in the, in the whole cathedral is measured from one position where she is, and then how many feet back and around, and then everybody is seated according to their closeness to her. And uh, I, when I read that, I thought, well, that's interesting. But anyway, we, we don't go that radical, but we do kind of, you know, grooms on one side, the family and friends, and work back. Uh, there to your maybe friends or however you want to do it, but it ends up something like that. And then, of course, once everybody is seated, then after that, you know, they've been playing a little music while that happens, and then they open the door in the back, start a little music, in comes the, you know, the, the groom, and the groomsmen march out, they're standing there, and then the music, down comes the bridesmaids, one after another, they come up, stand over there. And then after that, you know, the mom is brought down, and sad, or maybe before or after, but you know, and she's there. And then uh, at that point, now that she's down, then they'll close the doors again, and then they'll start the music again. And then mom stands up, and now everybody else stands up. You know, dad marches the, the, the bride down the aisle with her arm under his, brings him down, he gets down there, he goes, there's the exchange of hands, you know, uh, hands are over. Uh, there and then you go through the the vows and in that basically you know like ours we had kind of the traditional these and thou I don take thee Jean to be my wedded wife and those you know kind of you know that style of things and one of the things that uh, they that was part of the wedding ceremony was an, uh, forsaking all others 
I pledge thee my troth. Well, we had a rehearsal, and we went through all of our vows. We went through the whole thing. We actually had some premarital counseling. None of it dealt really much of anything at all, specifically anything that was really happening. But basically, when it came down to the wedding, I, all I cared about was I, wanted, I want the woman. You know, here the, you know, they're all wrapped up in everything, the colors and this and that, and picking out all the outfits. And I didn't care. I was, I was so tired of weddings by that point. I could care less. All I wanted was the woman. That's it. You do whatever you want. At the end of the day, I want the woman, period. That's, that's, that's all I'm in it for. I don't care about it. Only other thing, I wanted chocolate cake, which was unheard of at the time. They, back in the 60s when we got married, I think they made the cakes back in 1940 and froze them or something. And <laughs> it really, I'm serious. The wedding cakes, if you read some of you old, wedding cakes used to be made and they were, they, the frosting was like cardboard almost. They were tasteless. And they've changed all that now. But it was, but I, I just want chocolate cake. No, you can't. I want a chocolate cake. All right. They gave me a chocolate cake. But anyway, that and the woman. Well, anyway, so we get married, and we go down and, you know, recite the vows, and off we go get married. Come back from our honeymoon, and we're no sooner back. We're both in college, finishing up our senior year, and uh, Monday night comes along, and I'm walking out the door. I got my gym bag in, uh, in my hand, and, uh, uh, and Jean says to me as I'm walking out the door, she says, uh, where are you going? And uh, I said, well, it's Monday night, Monday night. Well, Monday nights, there was a friend that he had a sand volleyball court, a bunch of, we got, and we played two-man sand volleyball. We'd been doing it all the way through, dating all the way through our engagement. She knew all about it. She'd been to some of them. And uh, so, I mean, she, it's Monday night. She knew this. It was nothing new, you know, with it. And, uh, and so she says, you know, where are you going? And you know how you women can say stuff. It's, it's not just where are you going. It's, it's like, where do you think you're going? You know, I mean, kind of, a, well, you know how you can say it, like, you know, where, where are you, and, and make, you, you feel guilty. You feel like I'm doing something wrong. You know, so, well, it's Monday night. It's volleyball night. I play, you know, it's, I, we're going to college, got work and all this stuff. This is kind of like, woo, my Monday night, other guys, you know, and okay, have a nice time. Like, good luck, <laughs> have a nice time, you know, or something. And you know you're in trouble when you're driving away and you're talking to yourself about it. Where are you going? She knows where I'm going. Have a nice time. She, what do you mean? She didn't want me to have a nice time. That's what it is. She did not want me to have a nice time. What did I do wrong? You know, and did, 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 what, what's going on? Well, Thursday, I, I didn't let it bother me. I got over it quick. Don't get me wrong. But uh, next thing I know, Thursday night comes. Walking out the door. Got my gym bag in hand again. Where are you going? It's Thursday night. I played handball at the Y. This, oh, we go through this whole scenario again. Where are you going? And then, you know, and then I'm going, okay, have a nice time. And again, you're just, what's going on? Here? Why do they mess with your head? What are they doing? She's had a, we were engaged for a full year. At any time she wanted for an entire year, she could have said, by the way, remember that stuff you're doing? And not doing it anymore when we get married. It's over, you know. We're, we're staying home and knitting something on, or whatever, you know, something. Your you're, you're freedom, enjoy it now, or something. You're not doing this. But she never, no, she didn't ever say anything. Now we get married, and somehow it's all changed. One morning I wake up, after I'd been out the night before doing one of them, and she had kind of pulled the pillow over her head a little bit, and under the pillow was the biggest knife we owned. And I see this knife, I said, gee, there's a knife in bed. What do you do? What's going on here? She says, oh, I'm sorry. She said, you know, sometimes I hear noises outside, and I, I'm, I'm afraid, and you know, you're not here, and so I take the knife, and I have it, and then when you come home, I put it, and I guess I fell asleep with the knife under my pillow. I said, gee, and I rebuke her. I created, you're not trusting the Lord. He's going to take care of you. You're going to be fine. There's nothing to be afraid of. What's going on here? You know, and, I, and I, I, I'm all over for it. And then, you know, and, and, and kind of, you know, and I'm sitting there thinking, they changed the rules. You get married, they, they'd somehow or another have the right to change all the rules. And I'm kind of thinking and praying about it. Lord, what's, what's going on here? And out of nowhere, the Lord speaks to me. He says, she didn't change the rules. Oh, yes, she did. No, she didn't. You changed you know, do you change the rules yourself? I did not. No, I, yes. When you said, forsaking all others, I pledge thee my troth. Well, I had no idea what that meant. I'd never heard the word until we get married. You know, I mean, the other thing is, 
And no, I did. I said it, and I did, I'll admit that. He fed the words to me. I said the words. Big deal. I, yeah, again, what do I got to say? I'll say it. Just give me the woman at the end of the day. <laughs> sign wherever I got to sign, you know, whatever it is. Well, anyway, this, so, but you, the, the word troth, I mean, I was saying, I don't know what I mean. If I, if I ever get one, it's yours. I don't know what it is, but I'll give it. I, I, I pledge it to you. It's all yours. I thought they fed pigs out of it or something. I, would, I had no idea what it was. But anyway, so, but then I find out the word troth, it means fidelity. And what you're saying is forsaking all others, I pledge you my fidelity. And essentially what is happening in the marriage ceremony is you have everybody walk down. They're all sitting there's moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and cousins and everybody else all down, all your friends. And at this point in the ceremony, he is now publicly seeking I, everybody in the whole place, forsaking all others. I pledge her my troth. I pledge her my fidelity. She is now number one in my life. All of you kindly move back one pew. She is head of every one of you from now on. I had no idea that. I had no idea that's what was, was to be going on, the place that she was had. And here she, we get married, and next thing you know, she's competing with all my friends. I grew up in one house but until I get married, you know, and I had all these friends, grammar school, high school, college, fraternity, every, all this stuff. And we were good. We were close. And, and now all of a sudden she's there, and I loved her, and we were close. But, but I had my friends. And she, one time, she comes to me and she said, you know, I like listening to you on the phone sometimes because you tell your friends more than you tell me. And again, I had to correct her again. You know, you're listening to my private phone calls you know, with my friends. What do you think you're doing? I don't know if I did it quite that way. But anyway, it's kind of like, you know, she, she says, yeah, I, I realize she's competing with my friends on where she sits in, the, in, the, in what pew she's in. She was always getting moved up and back and around. She never knew where she stood. And I never made it clear or even had a concept of that it was to be clear and that that was key to, you know, basically all my friends, they've left me anyway. <laughs> they divorced me. They moved away or they died or whatever else, you know, and, and, and here, but, but, you know, the, I'll never forget, we hadn't been married very long and she was so sweet and loving. But one time she looks at me and she says to me, it's this real sweet. And she, she says, you know something? I said, what? And she says, you're my best friend. And I'm kind of thinking, really? You poor thing. You know, almost it's like, <laughs> you think I was looking for a friend when I got married? No, I got plenty of those. I wanted a woman to just be the woman. You know, here's where you fit, and here's where these guys fit, and all this. And I had no idea. I was just that naive or simple or whatever, that here there was something that was God was saying, you're not going to get anywhere until she knows where she's at with you. And you've made that clear. And that there is something there where you now, you know, uh, 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 there establish that. You need to sanctify her. She needs to know she's ahead of all of these others. And at wherever they are, they're lesser than her for the rest of your life. And how powerful that is. I mean, when the Jesus sanctifies, there's something there. He's never busy. We never call and say, you get a busy signal. We never get one, hey, no, I'm sorry, I'm with Moses. You know, Elijah and I got a little thing going on here. Hello, you know, Elijah and I were kind of Mount Transfiguration. We got business. Call back. You know, beep, beep, beep. Oh, they don't do that anymore. But anyway, you never get a busy son. It's always there. We're always front and son. And he says, not only that he might sanctify her, but then he might, that he might cleanse her. And here, you know, something there that essentially what this is saying, I mean, that a, a, a wife should never feel so clean as she does in her husband's presence. I mean, when somebody, Jesus has this way of, re, you know, of with us, we can feel like we're, we've blown it. Other people, you know, they've got the, everybody knows we've blown it. Everybody knows we're a mess. Everybody knows we're hopeless. We come before him and we're loved. We're forgiven. We're clean. He has this incredible way, and a wife should never feel so clean in all of her life as she does in her husband's presence. So adored, so accepted, uh, so washed over and cared for. And again, we don't, the, the th I, re I think the reason these are here is we don't do them. Men are not good at this. 
by nature. There are, there are things that we have to be taught. It's a supernatural book. And he says, we don't do this naturally. You know, they, you know many, many men, they, almost, they're, they're, they are with their wives almost the opposite. Maybe some of us, you know, we kind of grow up in a home, or I, I played a lot of sports. And one of the things that coaches, and right, you know, it could be, you know, you'd go mow the lawn, or you'd go, you know, play a sport, or you'd go do something, and the coach would say, hey, you can do a little better, try a little harder. You know, you know, put a little more time on this and do that and, and come back. And, you know, then one of the motivational skills the world uses is always putting the carrot out. There's something you could do better. You could try harder if you want to, if you want to succeed. And many husbands, we kind of learn that, and we can do that with our wife. And so they're never quite as good of a cook as they could be. You know, kind of like they can go prepare a meal, and she puts it out in front of you. How was it? Well... Nobody died tonight. You know, I guess, oh, wow, that's really, that's, 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 you're going to get home with that one, boy. No, I mean, we have these things where, you know, you could always cook a little better. The house could be a little cleaner. You could be a little better lover if you want to really work out. You want to really try. You're always, you know, a little short, always a little, little inadequate instead of, you know, something there, you know, where you, you, you're great. You're awesome. You're perfect. You know, and, uh, and hear that with Jesus. That's where we are. On one hand, he's always discipling, always training, always, never stops growing us up. But yet at the same time, in thy presence is the fullness of joy. With all the other things, there's that sense of, you know, of, of forgiveness and care and love. And uh, sometimes I feel so, so bad for women uh, these days, particularly, I live down in Orange County in Southern California, and it, as you may or may not know, it's the it, it truly is the plastic surgery center of the world. You know, I mean, there is constantly this incredible pressure on women. You know, I mean, everybody down there, their houses, their cars, their clothes, their stuff, they step out, and uh, and it's just a culture. Uh, you know, I, I get in the, I, I'm not a real self-conscious person when I go most places. I get in Orange County, get in the airport there, and, and I'll just see all these people that are decked out. It, I look at, you know, women, you know, you get off planes or they're going places. Orange County women, they're all, you know, it seems, I mean, incredibly long blonde hair, thin. You can't be too thin or too rich or down there kind of a thing, and they all decked out. This whole thing of, of it doesn't matter how old you are either. You know, you've got to, you've got to be stunning. You've got to work at it or work at it. And, uh, you know, to be accepted down there, it seems. And, the, and, and it's sad because I, uh, when I was a kid, it wasn't true. I remember my grandmothers very well, very well. They were wonderful grandmothers. But they were card-carrying, bona fide grandmas. I mean, they, they, they got old and they got old. They did, there was no big preventive things to stop it. They weren't fighting anything with it. They just accepted it. Everybody did. It's just their grandmas. And, and I mean, my grandma, it's funny. I, I have these pictures that I, st I, mean, that I see them so clearly. You know, in my, in my they still, I mean, they, they, there's something about grandmas back then. They all wore the same clothes. They did. I mean, they, they all had these dresses with these little teeny flowers all over them. Little floor. Any of you have grandma? You remember some of some? And then they, 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 had, they were trimmed with doilies, kind of like this. It looked like, yeah, I mean, whatever you call them. They had these. Okay, do you love your wife like you love your own body? Think about that. You know, we went out to lunch. We went out to Iden. You know, I'm not, I read this menu, it's like six pages, and we're reading all this, this different stuff, you know, what it is, and going back and forth and thinking about this. Everything that's going on, it had a little star by some that said spicy, and my stomach's, no, 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 no. Okay, what do you want? Sweetheart, I, tell me what you want. It's my job to deliver it to you. you we just, we had this wonderful dialogue that goes on back and forth with the menu and me and the waiter, Doug, and everything. Okay. Well, you know this? Yeah, you know, it's a little spicy, but then, well, let's see. We, and everybody's going, man, okay, no, yes, okay, okay, this one's still in, this one's out. You know, okay, this, you know, we're going page back and forth. We spent 15 minutes or something. There and basically this entire thing of just simply, hey, buddy. I just hang in there. It's coming. I promise you. I'm getting you the best thing I can find, you know, or something. Because I love my body. 
I, I, <laughs> too much. You know, that's is my problem with it. But at any rate, when you when you when when you love your own body and you nourish it, and uh, and you be, it, do you love your wife that way? Is it something there? Do you love your like you love your own flesh? For he said, he's no man ever yet hateth his flesh, but he nourishes it and he cherishes it, even as the Lord that cherishes. Nobody hates their flesh. You know, I mean, our body, we don't, we don't hate it, and yet it is constantly, constantly has unending needs. You know, you get up in the morning, and you're no sooner kind of waking up, and you inhale and go, whoa, <laughs> something crawled in there and died overnight. I mean, whoa, what happened in there overnight? My breath is terrible. You know, you, well, you go in there and, and get toothbrush, get some toothpaste, and start cleaning the thing up. Then you look in the mirror and, oh, man, you know, stubble. But do you get mad? Do you get upset? Do you look there at your face? I shaved you yesterday, you stinking <laughs> flap. But you just slap yourself around? No, you don't hate your flesh. You nourish it. You take care of it. You know, you get a whiff of an armpit. Oh, oh man. He said, I washed you yesterday and the, day be- and the day before, and here you stink again. What do I got to do? I'm just going to turn that on full hot as I can, and you're going in there. I'm burning it out of you. No. We go in there, get the, get the temperature just right. You happy now? And you go in there. We even sing to it, maybe. You know, I mean, type of the thing. I mean, we, are, we nourish it. We cherish it. We don't hate it. And here so often our wife comes, and she has a need. Something there's a need with her, honey. I need 20 bucks. Beg your pardon? I need 20 bucks. What'd you do with the 20 bucks I gave you last month? Excuse me? You haven't even turned in the receipts on that yet, and now you want to be give you 20 more? What, what's the kind of stewardship is that? Do I look like a money tree to you or something? Is that what I am? Am I a money tree? You said, come on, just everything that shakes off. It's all yours. Take it. But boy, when we fishing season comes, oh, we can get the rod and reel we want. We find the money for that. When, oh, somebody's a fisherman. I saw that. But anyway, or hunting season or whatever else, or new tires for the four by or whatever it is. It's, you know, we, we find a way to do things, but to sit there. After all these other things that we went and did and realized, but what presents back to you is none of that. What presents back to you is something there that you look there and you want to see them happy. You want to see, you know, something, you know, there, you know, go on in. And sometimes we struggle. Many years ago when I left staff at Costa Mesa, well, I was still on staff when I went up to the Twin Peaks, but we went up to, to buy a home up in the mountains. We had a home that we were selling down by Calvary, and uh, we were taking that money and buying a house. Well, there was a house up there for sale. It was actually, believe it or not, built by the high school construction class. Never heard of such a thing. And, uh, but it was going up for auction, and the price I understood was going to be pretty reasonable. Well, I was concerned. The construction class building a house, so I actually went to uh, the building department and talked to an ins- building inspector, and they said, you know anything about this house? He said, it's an incredible house. I've been the inspector on it. And he says, these guys in the construction, oh, it's all overseen by roofers, companies, by, you know, uh, drywallers, by electric. They, they, they check every, all their work out. You know, is there, but er, what everything calls for three nails, they put in four. Everything's got to be done. They're graded on it. Every connection with the plumbing, everything. They go through, make it all. He said, it's actually probably better than your average house you could buy up here. Well, so we decided to bid on it. I couldn't go up the night that, it, that the, it was by auction, you had to put in $1,000, you know, just to bid on it, and then what your bid was, and how is this, you know, sealed bid, and then after they opened them up, if somebody that had put in the first money now still wanted to bid for it, nobody else could, but you had to do that, you, you could do it, but you had to increase the price, the previous price, by 5%, not two bucks or something to go back and forth. You, in other words, you, it was designed to really make you, you know, get the top dollar that you're willing to give you know, to pay for it. Well, so my dad sits down with me. I could not go that night. I was teaching somewhere. And my dad sits down with well, mom and I. We'll take Gene and the kids up and we'll do it for you. And so he, now I'm a Scotsman. Are there any Scotsmen? Are there any Scottish? There? God bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else around here going? Oh, two. There we are. Come on. But anyway, I don't know what you know about Scotsmen, but we're tight. 
if you're a good Scottish. And we know it. And we're proud of it. You know, like being you know, Scottish. You know, the, in fact, my motto as a Scotsman is, where there's a will, I want to be in it. You know, I mean, so, but anyway. <laughs> but the, anyway, so my dad says, here, uh, you know, well, we'll go up and do this. Well, the, how, here's how you become a Scotsman. You have Scottish parents. So my dad taught me how to be a Scot. Not only that was one, but how to be one. And so he was tight. And so, okay, we're going over. Dad, what's the final highest price? We used to help me with the finances and figuring it out, what we pay and principal issue, tax insurance, all this. So, because we really kind of, Jean loved the house. She really wanted it. And so, okay, if we got to, if they won't take, if this doesn't work, we can go up, you know, uh, a little, uh, you know, we can go up, okay, this is it, max. And uh, I think it was 50. 49.9 or I don't know what it was, but anyway, so anyway, so I go off teaching, I come back, they're already back from the thing, I come in the house, Jean's kind of singing around, dancing around, she's, so obviously I knew the moment I walked in the door, we got the house. So I came out and said, we get it? Yeah, we got it. And of course, you know, my question immediately that I wanted to know was, how much was it? Yes. And, and she said, oh, I don't know, your dad's out there and the other, you, that's, that's between you men, you go talk to him. I said, well, how much, how will you talk to him? So I walked in there and said, Dad, so we got the house. Yep, we got the house. Well, how much was it? It was uh, 51, 240. I said, Dad, it was, it was like two, that, that's like 2,000 more than the top max. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm there like, whoa. You know, I'm, and, and he reads my face kind of and uh, he says, uh, you, you want some advice? I, I think I need some and some money too, you know, or something. <laughs> and, but he looks at me and he says, Don, he that has a happy wife, as a happy wife, and whatever that cost you, pay it. And, uh, you know, with it, because the alternative is very expensive. <laughs> but, and it's not money, that's not the issue. The issue is though, I mean, it was in this case, and once in a while it may be. Incidentally, we sold that house for three times the price four years later. It just, this is the early 70s and everything just took off. It was an unbelievable blessing to us. But it was something there to, to where you look and, and, and realize there, the, you know, caring for each other, presenting uh, you know, and, and there, and, uh, and loving and showing love. You know, women are usually on the whole, and this is categorically not always true, but many times they're the most affectionate. They're the ones that, you know, can be huggy and carry, and men, we kind of, you know, well, whatever. You know, I'm okay with that. I, you know, whatever. But, you know, we're, we're not as sensitive like that. And, uh, and we can, and, and th that's tough in a marriage. I heard a story of this couple, they'd been married for 50 years, and they fought like crazy, they never got along. They had four children, and the children just endured this you know, terrible marriage and tension all the time. 50 years, though, they hung in, and finally the kids got together and thought, you know, for our, for our parents' anniversary, we're going to give them a trip to a married psychiatrist. And, get them, and so they get them a bunch of appointments for this, and they go. And of course, they go in, and they, he's a young psychiatrist, he's never really had anything, just kind of getting into it. And he sits down with him, starts talking, and the wife, she opens right open up, and, and she's, you know, just crying. And I tried, you know, and she's going sobbing. And, and uh, then he looks over at the, the, the guy there now after 50 years of marriage, and he's just a bump on the log, arms are crossed, staring across, looking at him. And he's, he can't get through to him. Well, the next appointment, you know, again, she's just soft. She's like putty. She wants to grow. She wants to learn whatever it is. And he's there just can't break. He's trying anything. He's calling his other friends there that, you know, what do I do? How do you handle this? Going through it, getting the advice. Nothing happens. Goes down to the next appointment. Calls his, you know, college professors and everybody in this. Getting on anything. I got to succeed at this. This is, something's got to break through. No matter what he did. Come down to the final appointment, nothing. Nothing on this, no response, just as hardened of an old guy. You know, and he looks there, and, he's, and so the appointment's over, time is up, no success. And so they're leaving, and he stands up, and he's just disgusted, you know, and things, he failed. But all of a sudden, he stops, and he says, wait a minute. He's, and he says to the, you know, 75-year-old wife or something, he says, come here. Come here. She walks over to him. He wraps an arm around her waist, bends her over, puts his, her head in his hand, bends down, gives her this big kiss. 
right on the lips. Just holds her there for a minute. Brings her back up. Her eyes are spinning. She had nothing like that in 50 years. And, and then he, he looks over at the guy and he says, did you see what I just did? I said, yeah, I saw that. And he said, this woman needs this. A minimum, a minimum of three times a week. Do you understand me? And he says, I'll have her here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> some guys just don't get it. They just don't get it. That, you know what it is of their responsibility. And again, it's the wife learning to submit to her husband. It, 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 it takes the Spirit of God to do it. It's not natural to her. And it's not natural that men. It's, this is why the, they're in the Bible. It's not a suggestion. It's something God says, no, the Holy Spirit will help you do this. He'll help you become this. You need to, to learn on this and let the Spirit of God help you. And you'll be happy if you do. And, uh, you know, the story, well, in the Bible, it's in the Bible, so they're comfortable here. But, you know, one day, you know, here's Adam in the garden, and the Lord comes to Adam in the garden, and he, and he tells Adam, you know, it isn't, isn't good that you're alone. You know the story. And, uh, and, and he says, well, what's the plan? And, uh, and the Lord says, well, I'm going to make you a woman. And uh, Adam says, well, well, what's that? And uh, he said, don't worry about it. I got it all under control. It's in the Hebrew, by the way. It's there. But anyway, he says, it's, it's, she'll be perfect. She'll be awesome. She'll be incredible. And uh, she, you know, she'll be uh, able to cook. Oh, un unbelievable cook. German, French, Italian, Spanish, food, you know, in, anything whatsoever, Japanese, everything. And this is before there were any Japanese or French or Italian people. But she can cook it all. She'll be gourmet cook. You know, at all. And she, 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 house, she'll be an incredible housemaker. I mean, we're talking pouring the foundation, rough plumbing, electrical roofing, everything. She will build you the most beautiful home you ever saw. Awesome. And gardening. She'll love gardening. All the hedges will be trimmed like animals. It'll just be like living in the most awesome park. Disney will admire it, you know, and stuff. It'll just be beautiful. And beautiful children. She's going to give you absolutely beautiful, beautiful children. She'll be gorgeous. She'll be gentle. She'll be submissive. It'll just be awesome. And Adam is, wow. And he said, well, uh, what will that cost me? And the Lord says, well, a model like that, it'll, it'll cost you an arm and a leg. And Adam, he thinks for a minute. He said, well, uh, what can I get for a rib? <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And the, the, the moral of the story is in marriage, you kind of get what you pay for. You know, when there's somebody that wants to just skim through and not be what they ought to be, they're not going to get a lot out of it. But Jesus, on the other hand, for his bride, he just didn't give an arm or leg, he gave his life. He gave everything. And he says that the man would be the savior of the body as Christ. When somebody looks and says that well, if there's anything that I want to save in my life, it's my marriage. If there's anything worth saving, you know, I want to be this man. And hopefully today, I know that the tendency is if you're a wife, you say, well, I, I hope he's listening. That doesn't help. You can pray for him. And if you're a man, you, well, I hope she remembers the submissive part. Well, you can pray for him, but don't, don't worry about that. Just be able to say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? What will strengthen my role in this, in my home? Amen. Lord, thank you for your word, and Lord, thank you for the challenge. Lord, these are in the Bible because we're not. We don't do these naturally. We don't know how to do them. Only you can do them, and, it, and Lord, these are designed to increase our dependence upon you, where we look and say, this is impossible. I can't do this. This is beyond me, and you say, of course it's impossible. With man, it's impossible, but all things are possible with me. Just trust me. Turn to me and watch what I'll do. So, Lord, soften us and tender us. Help us and strengthen us, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.